Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to sit under your word, to be encouraged by our friends, our family, our brothers and sisters. I pray that we would be really identifying what it is in our life that we're longing for. I pray that we would be longing for you in every area of our lives. I pray that you would be guiding us tonight, that your Holy Spirit would be teaching us, convicting us, and that you would be revealing yourself to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to this chapter in Luke chapter 2. Uh, we're about halfway through now as we continue in our series. We're going to start at verse 22 and go all the way down to verse 40. Uh, so why don't you read with me? When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God, and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. There's quite a lot there. And I'm not going to have all the time to dissect everything, but one thing that we notice is Luke mentions a lot of names, right? There's a lot of characters here. I think it's really important that we remember who Luke was, the type of person he was. See, he was a doctor, so he would have had to have been very precise and detailed, like all doctors are. I mean, have you ever been to a doctor, uh, you've gone in for surgery, and they're like, oh, do I cut here or there? Oh, no, I've just like cut, it. oh, oh my goodness. Well, that... Well, if you meet a doctor like that, chances are they'll probably be sued, uh, they will lose their job, they'll never be able to practice uh, being a doctor again, and depending on what happened to their patient, imprisonment could be an option too. But the point of this story is doctors are generally very detailed and precise, and that's the man that Luke was. So we know he's not just name-dropping here for no apparent reason. There is a purpose behind this. The first people we meet are Joseph and Mary. Have a look at verse 22 and 24. Luke says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. I just want you to notice the first four words there. When the time came, Mary and Joseph did what the law of Moses, given by God, required them to do. This isn't something to gloss over as like, oh yeah, you know, they just, they went to Jerusalem and they did the purification thing, you know? No, this is important because this is an act of obedience for Mary and Joseph, right? Right? We have so many distractions in our world. You know, just think about this for a sec. 
we are filling our minds with ads from TV, the radio, we see things plastered on buses, walls, poles, from Facebook, YouTube now has ads. How annoying are ads on YouTube? Oh my goodness. So many distractions, right? Now sure, Mary and Joseph didn't have all of these ads from YouTube or Facebook, but what they did have was a lot of physical hard labor work. Joseph was a carpenter, and he's now got a child to take care of as well as a wife. He has to provide for his family. Can you imagine Joseph in this situation? Would it have been perfectly reasonable for him to say to Mary, you know what, let's not go to Jerusalem. Let's skip the purification rites. I've really got a lot of work to do if I'm going to put food on the table for you and the baby. In fact, I could use a hand around here too. Would you be able to like, just go down the, go downtown and get me a few supplies so that I can finish this job and get some money and then we can get some food and supplies? But no, that's not what Joseph and Mary did. They dropped everything that they had on and they went to Jerusalem to do what the law of God required of them. I wonder if you would have done the same thing. I wonder if you would keep putting things in front of God, in front of your relationship with him, like work or a social life or study or sports. And don't get me wrong, those things on their own, they're not bad. In fact, we should be thanking God for all of those things, right? But when you start putting them in front of him, then it becomes a problem. Like for me, uh, there's no way that I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to read the Bible. That's way too early. I'm going to wait till about 8 or 9 when I actually wake up. But you know what I will do at 6 o'clock in the morning or 5.30 in the morning or even 3.20 in the morning once? I won't read my Bible. But I will watch Manchester United play live. I won't read my Bible, but I'm going to watch a game of soccer that's ridiculous. That is something that I need to work on too. And we can encourage each other in that, right? We can't keep putting things in front of God. But I don't want that to just be one act of obedience because that's not what I see from Mary and Joseph's lives. We've seen them circumcise Jesus on the eighth day, like God said. We've seen them give the child the same name that Gabriel told them to in chapter 1. And now we're seeing them continue in these acts of obedience, act after act. And they're going to Jerusalem like the law of God is requiring of them. <clears throat> now from that, I can see why Luke is mentioning these two people. I mean, they were, they were after all, the earthly parents of Jesus. But as I was reading this... I wondered, what about old man Simeon and old woman Anna? Why, why are they mentioned? I think part of the reason is because here we've got these two old Jewish saints that are basically representing the very best of the old covenant, the old promises, the Old Testament, giving way to the new covenant, the new promises, the new testament that is coming to fulfillment in the appearance of the Lord's Messiah. But again... Why these two? Of all the old Jewish saints in the time, surely there would have been others. Why, why is it these two that Luke specifically mentions? It's because of their character and the qualities that they have, much like with Mary and Joseph. Just have a look at Simeon in verse 25. He is a man in Jerusalem who was righteous and devout. All right, so here's a guy who loved God. He's considered righteous, so he's in a right standing with God. You know, he's in a good spot. He's devoting time to the Lord, all great things. I'm sure other people in that time would have been doing the exact same thing too. I mean, we're going to read about Anna a little bit later, and she's done exactly this. So why Simeon specifically? I think it's because of what he was looking forward to, what he was hoping for, what he was longing for. See, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, what is this consolation? 
Or consolation in this sense is used uh, as like the restoration of Israel. It emphasizes God intervening for his people to deliver them from his enemies and usher in this new kingdom, one of peace, one of justice. Doesn't that sound nice? There'll be no more pain, no more hurt or sorrow, no more hunger, no more stress, no more exams or assignments. Oh, that sounds great. I have two assignments next week. Let Jesus come now, please. (sighs) Are you longing for this new kingdom? I am. Simeon was. He knew that this consolation would come with the appearance of the Lord's Messiah. But he wasn't the only one that was longing for this to happen. We meet Anna in verse 36. And what what does Luke say about her? Have a look at 37. It says, She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Wow. Her faith blows mine way out of the park. Here we have an old woman, Anna, who is devoting day and day, night and night to the Lord, fasting and praying. Praying, She never left the temple but worshipped. I mentioned earlier some of the distractions that we face in our world. And I can't help but admire this woman here. Like how often do we devote an entire day to God to worship? Just one day. Like we get up early, we pray, we read our Bibles, we pray again. We listen to some Christian music, MBM's albums, really good, maybe buy that one. Maybe we go for a hike and admire God's creation and pray again. Or maybe we visit friends intentionally and specifically to see how God is impacting their lives and encourage one another instead of talking about that awesome game of Apex Legends that happened last night. Now, I'm not saying we give up worshipping and praising God every other day just for this one. No. No. What I'm saying is we can spend an entire day devoted to God. Just being still and knowing that He's sovereign, that He's God. Just one day, that's it. Anna does this day and night, and I'm challenged by this. I don't know about you. I mean, even with the fasting, do you know why Anna fasts? Like she's saying, God... Man, I'm so hungry, but you know what? I love you more. God, I want you more. God, I need you more than I need this food to sustain my body. That's what she's saying. That shows her deep yearning and longing for God. And I think this is a perfectly reasonable thing for us to do too. I mean, we could fast from food for a day. We could fast from Netflix, social media, Xbox, whatever it is. In fact, you know what I want you to do right now with your pen and paper? I want you to think about that one thing that you love, that maybe you keep putting in front of God. I want you to write it down. That's going to be the thing that you fast from, whether it's from a whole day, a couple of days, a week. That's up to you. But use that to show that you love God more than that thing. And then when you get into discussion groups later on, share that with everyone in your group and your leader. Ask them what they're going to fast from. And then encourage each other and hold each other accountable in that way too. For me personally, I was going to say food, but I tend to skip breakfast anyway, so I don't think that would be too much of a problem. Um, I was thinking maybe I fast from FIFA for like an entire week, the amount of time I spend on that. Um, That might be a bit more up my alley and a bit more difficult. And you guys can hold me accountable for that as well. I spend way too much time on that. Now, as amazing as Anna's faith is, she takes it one step further, yet again. Have a look at this. She goes out. We see her speaking about Jesus to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So here again, we have this language of longing and yearning for consolation or redemption for God's people. 
I think Luke really wants us to understand these two characters, what drives them, what motivates them, what their longing is, because it's this longing for God to act that makes them fit to actually recognize this child is the Christ of the Old Testament. This is the Messiah of the Old Testament. This is the salvation spoken of in the Old Testament. Their longing is what makes them fit for that. Now, I'm going to ask you again. What is it that you are longing for? Is it a new video game that's coming out later this year? Is it a boyfriend or girlfriend? Is it money? Is it social status? Is it to finally move out of home so that you can live your own life and make your own decisions? Is it Avengers Endgame that's coming out in April this year? Is that what you're longing for? Because you know what? Who here is coming to the launch? Hands up. Awesome. Do you guys know that that movie comes out while you're at launch? So let me challenge you. If you're not coming to the launch just so you can see that movie, let me challenge you. Fast from that movie for like two days. Spend an entire week just devoted to God. Devote that time to growing in your love, knowledge, faith, relationship with God and with each other instead of going to see that movie. Show that you love God more than you love Avengers. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be a great thing to do at the launch? Now, do you know what I'm actually longing for at the moment? I'm longing to finish uni, finally. Oh, my word. I graduated from high school in 2012. It was only meant to take me five years to finish all of my uni, and then I could go out into schools and teach as a PE teacher. It is now 2019, and I'm still not done. I've still got this year and next year. A couple of setbacks, I failed some units. That's my fault. Procrastination and me were really good mates. Uh, I don't recommend becoming friends with him. <sighs> then I just spent about a year and a half actually not knowing whether I was going to complete my uni degree and go into teaching. But God directed me back. And so I'm back at uni. I've got two more years. I just can't wait to be done. Like, I just want to be done. I want to be in schools teaching. I want to see how God is going to use me to impact the public education system. And while that is a good longing to have, it shouldn't be as great as my longing for Christ to return. It shouldn't be as great as my longing to see his kingdom come. It shouldn't be as great as my longing for souls to be saved. That is the longing that we should have as Christians. That is what should drive us. That is what we should build our life on. And if you're not a Christian, did you know that God might be preparing your heart right now? That that's why you're here. Hand up if you were invited by a friend and that's why you're here. There's a few hands going up. That's good. That's a bit encouraging. Can we, why don't we, as a youth group, invite more friends so we have more hands coming up? That when we ask who's here because a friend invited them, we basically have half the youth group having their hands up. That would be super encouraging. But let me ask you if you put your hand up, are you here because your friend asked you? Or are you here because God wants you to be here to hear the gospel? Because he wants you to hear about his son? Something to consider. In fact, I wonder what it is that some of you are going through right now. Some of you might be having a really tough time. It might be really hard. It might be a struggle. I want you to know that as a youth group, we are here for you as best as we can. But I also want to ask if you realize God can actually use that. That he uses that pain. He uses that hurt, that longing for peace for restored relationships. He uses that longing to reveal himself to you and to draw you back to Christ. 
God, he can stir up this deep and powerful longing in your heart for this redemption and peace that can only come from Christ. I wonder if some of you here tonight will see that truth. I think the question now is how? How does God stir up this longing? How does he reveal truth to us? Well, let's come back to our story here with Simeon to see who reveals, who moves, and who stirs him. Verse 26 and 27 says, The Holy Spirit is the one that revealed to him he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. It was the Holy Spirit that moved him. Now, this isn't the Spirit controlling Simeon's body. No, this is the Holy Spirit stirring up something in Simeon. He responded to that and he obeyed. The Holy Spirit has a very specific role and does many amazing things in the life of a Christian, which is really important for us to understand. Have a look again at verse 26. It had been revealed to him. The Holy Spirit reveals things to us. He reveals God to us. He reveals the Father's plans to us. He reveals Christ to us. He reveals the glory and beauty and majesty of God to us. And he reveals our sin to us as well. In John 14, 17 and 15, 26, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. In John 14, 26, he's described as the helper who will teach us. In John 16, 8 to 11, he says the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. You see, the Holy Spirit, he convicts us of our own sinfulness He teaches us the ways of righteousness and makes us more and more like Christ. But do you listen to him? He speaks in so many different ways. He's like, he's that voice that you hear telling you right from wrong. Like, Paul, don't look at that image. Don't look at that video. Don't watch porn. It is evil. It is unsatisfactory. It will not satisfy. It is worthless. Christ is eternal. Christ will satisfy you. So come and enjoy him instead. He can use your Christian friends to point out a sin in your life that maybe you don't even know is there. Like maybe a friend comes up to you uh, after you're mucking around and joking and he says, hey man, I, I don't think you should have said that. Like I know you're joking and all, but that really didn't reflect Christ at all. I think you actually hurt a few people in the process. And so you take that on board and you apologize, you ask for forgiveness, you repent and you pray to God for all of that. You know, nothing I say now is actually going to convince you of anything. It's only the Holy Spirit working in your heart that helps you to understand His Scriptures, revealing Christ to you. So that you can understand the beauty of God and the depths of the gospel. You need to listen to him. Otherwise, what's the point in even calling yourself a Christian? It's like, I'm a swimming coach, right? I have this kid in my squad. uh, He come up to me uh, one time and was like, can I train four times a week instead of three? When am I moving up to the next squad? At first, I'm like, awesome. This is fantastic. This guy, this guy is keen. He's motivated. He wants to learn. He wants to improve. And then we get into the training session and I start saying what we're doing, why we're doing it, how to do it well because that's my, co- that's my job as a coach. And he does something different. He goes off and does his own thing. Like I say, do this drill. He does something else. And then the people behind him are very confused because I've said to do one thing, he's doing who knows what. And so they're mixing things up and doing all sorts of stuff. And that just shows me he really doesn't want to listen. He really doesn't want to learn or improve or get better. Otherwise, why even bother asking me in the first place if he's not going to listen? In a a similar way, 
We can ask the Spirit to guide us, to teach us, to convict us. And you know what we do? We go off and do our own thing anyway. Like, what's, what's the point in even asking him if we're not going to listen? We're just going to do our own thing. There's no point. You know what? In the process, when we're doing that, we can actually lead people astray. That's a very, very dangerous thing to do. So we really need to listen to the Holy Spirit when he guides us and teaches us. He wants you to know that these longings you have for money, for power, for uh, friends, popularity, uni degrees, or anything else in the world, they're not going to satisfy. But they will be satisfied in Christ because He is our salvation. He is our light for revelation. He is our glory. And that is Simeon's song here in Luke's Gospel. It echoes Isaiah of the Old Testament. I mean, have a look at some of these similarities. Isaiah says, The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Simeon says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. Isaiah says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. It is too light a thing. It would be a dishonor to God's servant Messiah if he did not give him more than simply to restore Israel. Do you understand the gravity of that? That it's not enough for Jesus to save all the tribes of Jacob, all the tribes of the Old Testament that God kept. It's not enough. God is bigger than that. He's greater than that. He's more compassionate, loving, and gracious than that. Have a look at what Simeon says. He assigns two tasks to Jesus, who at this time, remember, is just a baby. So we've got baby Jesus. He is the light of the world, bringing revelation to all nations. That's big. He will reveal the true God, the true way of salvation to everyone. And how Has he done this? By defeating death and sin and the devil on the cross. By dying the most painful death you could imagine and taking all our dark and evil sin upon himself. Jesus has revealed God to us and we can encounter him every single time we open his word. Every time. He has lit up this darkened world so we can see the truth and the way and the life in the one who died for me and for you. He has fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. And that is a fundamental truth to the way that we even begin to read and understand the Bible. John Piper puts it like this. With Jesus comes a new era, but when... But the Old, when properly understood, is not against it. Right? The Old Testament isn't against the New Testament, but actually it's in harmony with it. So the Old Testament is not something to be scrunched up and tossed away as old, irrelevant, and out of date. Rather, with Christ, we see the fulfillment of all that was written. And as we, like Simeon and like Anna, are waiting for this complete fulfillment of the words written here, listen to the Holy Spirit and consider what it is that you are really longing for. Because for Phil, this question reached a climax when God had stirred up these longings in his heart only to reveal himself through someone else's conversion story through the red frogs at schoolies, through at church, through the Bible, through Jesus himself. 
Some of you might be thinking that that story sounds a little familiar. That's probably because it is. Phil is me. I am not named Phil. That guy I was talking about, me. God stirred up these longings and desires in me for relationships and connections only for him to reveal himself to me so that I could know him, so that I knew that I was known by him and I could be in a relationship with the one who made me. He used those longings to reveal the truth. But you know what? This story of longing, it's not just mine. It's yours as well. I hear stories of youth longing for uh, relationships, but they're content with the one they have in God, in Christ, because they know that he's the one that satisfies, that he's the one that's never going to let them down, that he's the one that loves them. I hear uh, stories uh, of youth giving up uh, so many things in their life so that they can just be here at youth group, at church, just to hear the word being preached. I heard a story uh, of a leader who uh, studied so much to get good grades for her HSC. Didn't give any credit to God and then about two weeks out from the HSC exam, she had tendonitis in her wrist. So all of that hard work was almost really for nothing because she couldn't really write. And so God was basically saying, you know what, if you get into uni, it's because it's because of me. It's because I want you to be at uni. And she did get into uni and she gave all of that glory and credit to God. I heard a story of someone here at this youth group who didn't really care much about meeting new people, uh, getting to know them. And then since becoming a Christian, she's experienced this love of God in her life that she wants to share with other people. She wants to spread the gospel to her friends. She wants to share that love. And that is amazing. These are the type of stories we love hearing because God works through those longings to reveal himself. Let me ask you one more time. What is it you long for, MBM Youth? Because what you long for is what will drive you. What you long for is what will motivate you. And what you long for is what gonna, it's what's going to keep you going in this broken world. More importantly, what you long for is what you will build your life on.